Welcome everyone to the session Stuck in Limbo with Magical Solution by Isabel. Uh, it's going to be an interesting talk and uh, we are glad Isabel can join us today. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for lovely hosting and thank you for having me. So this is a session called Stuck in Limbo with Magical Solutions um, and I'm Isabel Evans. So who am I? Well, I am somebody who has been in IT since the 1970s. So I did my computer science degree in the 1970s, worked for a business programmer. During the 1980s, I came into testing, uh, I was tester, test manager, quality manager. And then from 1990 onwards, um, I was still working as a practitioner, but also um, uh, I was contracting, I was consultant, I was teaching and speaking. Um, and that included, towards the end of that time, um, a visit to Agile India in 2017, which I have to say was one of the loveliest conferences I've ever been to. And I found a couple of pictures. Uh, there's me chatting in an interview with somebody about Agile processes. And another picture, which is, I remember there was a session where somebody came and taught us all drumming. So this is me attempting to drum, and you can see a look of slightly worried concentration on my face as I learn a new, um, a new, uh, I'm not going to say skill, it didn't get that far, but very enjoyable, lovely conference, and it's a real pleasure to be back. So also what happened in 2017 was I'd started to reflect on my career, and I'd started to reflect on some of the things that I was noticing in my consultancy and contract work and as a teacher which was that in the 1980s, in the testing work that I was doing at that stage, we were using test tools to help us execute tests. And in that particular company, that was a very standard way of doing things. And the test tool was built alongside and as part of the software that was under test. So the things were very linked together. Um, and we did a lot of exploratory testing and then coming out of that exploratory testing, when we got the uh, software stable to a point that the tests were passing, we would then automate those tests so that we could keep running them as regression packs in the background. And then through the 1990s and 2010s in other organizations, I was seeing that people were struggling with test automation, perhaps with tools they'd bought in, perhaps with, um, scripting of different sorts and not just with the automation of executing the tests actually running the tests but also with test management tools and other tools and i was seeing a lot of debate about what automation was whether it was possible to automate tests and so on and so forth and a lot of problems and i was wondering what are the causes of these and i started researching into this and therefore became a student again. So I went back to university and I'm now a student at the University of Malta and I'm doing postgraduate research into the human aspects of test tools with an expected completion date of 2025, by which time I will be 70. And there's a thing to think about. So that's, that's, who, that's who I am. And sometimes people say to me, why University of Malta? And here's a picture I took in February 2020, which was, of course, with the pandemic, the last time that I got a chance to go out to Malta. I actually live in the UK, in Scotland, and I go out to Malta occasionally. This was my last visit before the pandemic. Um, and I think that picture of the beach in Malta tells you why. If you live in Scotland, which is chilly in February, it's cold in February, why going to Malta is, is a nice idea. But actually also importantly, they have a big ICT faculty. They're doing a lot of research into software testing already. They're doing a lot of research into the human aspects of software and human aspects of software testing. So it just fitted really nicely with what I was interested in in, uh, in, in looking at. And it's been a real big learning curve for me, learning to become an academic researcher after so many years in industry. 
So back to the beginning, what was my motivation? I said to you, didn't I? I was noticing challenges that people were having with, with test automation. And one of the debates that was going on around 2015, 2017, that sort of time, which I think is still going on actually, is, is this because the testers don't have good enough skill sets or is it that the tools need to be more usable, that they've not been designed very well? And because of my background, which had included quite a lot in usability work, I was inclined towards the tools need to support the people and was thinking, right, so what can we do to make tools more usable? And of course, that little um, cartoon there actually sums up many problems that we have in the IT industry, in software. Are the users stupid? No, they're not. There's problems with the software. And this is true, perhaps, for test automation tools and test management tools as well. So there was this debate. I was interested in the debate. What evidence was there? I decided to become a student and research this academically so that I've got uh, a basis for my research, if you like. I've got there's some rigor behind it. I was interested in getting that academic rigor and not simply having an opinion. One of the reasons that that's interesting, I'm just going to go back again. One of the reasons that's interesting is because if you've worked in something for decades and if people see you as being an expert and if you're doing training and so on, it's very easy to just think that your opinion is the thing that's worth hearing. And of course, as soon as you get into academia, no evidence is required it's no good me just having an opinion it's no good saying, in my experience this happens that's not good enough i have to go and look for other evidence my opinion is not the thing that's driving it and i think that's really valuable for this research that actually it's about it's about gathering evidence so if we think about the purpose of the software industry for all of its history as long as people have been building software and where we put the beginning of that history is a whole other discussion. It's about automating tasks and activities. We want to save time and money. We want to be able to do things we can't do ourselves. Um, we want to remove repetitive tasks because human beings aren't very good at that. We want to be safer. There's lots of benefits. And actually, there's effects on people, benefits and disadvantages. So even if you go back to Industrial Revolution 1 and 2, uh, back in the Victorian era, back in the 19th century, you've got people automating things like hand looms becoming power looms. It affects people. There's benefits because you can do things faster and there's disadvantages because of the effect on people's jobs. So that's in very quick summary. So if we think about our own activities within the software industry, then we start asking, can those be automated? Because we want to save and time money and so on and so forth, remove repetition. But is it possible to do that? And what is the effect on people? There are benefits and there are disadvantages. And interestingly, if you look at the history of the IT industry, we talk a lot in testing about test tools and the automation of test execution and whether that's possible or not. But actually, there's a long history of people trying to automate programming. So I can remember back in the 70s and 80s, people saying, oh, we're going to reach a point quite soon where we're not going to need people doing programming because we can replace that by tools. And people are still saying those types of things. So it's interesting, isn't it, that we can see that we could get benefits if we can use more tooling and use more more um, automation but is that possible and what's the effect on people uh, and as an example of that here's a picture of not actually my first washing machine but the model of washing machine that i first had very very simple you filled it up with a hose had a hose on the side that you dropped to uh, let the water out of the bottom you just had a hole in the bottom of it very very simple just an on off switch it was really amazing. It was an amazing tool to possess after I'd been washing sheets and so on by hand. Um, but simple, and it's not automating the process of doing the laundry. So let's look at the one on the right, which is a modern machine. 
and it works off your mobile phone. You offer your mobile phone up to it and it switches on and off and programs it and so on and so forth. It's a clever solution that works as easily as a contactless payment system. That's what it says in the advert. And it's called an automatic washing machine. But it's not an automatic laundry machine. It doesn't pick up and sort the dirty clothes. It doesn't do the ironing. It doesn't fold the clothes and put them away. It doesn't make decisions about what needs washing and, and what needs washing together and what needs separating. It can do one little bit of the whole process of laundry. That's all. Okay, so automation, it has benefits. And this is a, a quote from Julian Harty, who I know is an old friend of this conference. No matter how valuable in-person testing is, effective automation is able to increase the value of overall testing by increasing its range. So what he's saying here is there are some things we can do by using tools to help us that we wouldn't be able to do if we didn't have the tools. And even if you look at really quite simple tools, like say a screwdriver, it'd be really hard to put a screw into a piece of wood without a screwdriver. So tools help us, that's our purpose. And some things like the automatic washing machine, we can automate and when we can do things that we perhaps couldn't do before. However, if you look at Bark and Bolton, James Bark and Michael Bolton, they wrote a, they've got a, a website, Context Driven Approach to Automation in Testing, and they talk about a shallow, narrow and ritualistic approach to tool use. And they talk about the idea there's a false belief that testing is a mechanical repetitive processing and saying instead it's a challenging intellectual process. And I remember talking to Michael about this once and saying to him, you know, people are talking about automating programming and he just rolled his eyes and just said, yeah, that's going to happen. And that's the thing you see, which are the tasks where we require a human brain and which are the tasks that we can actually automate? So there's a lot of things to, 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 to debate there. And I think there's some interesting things happening with machine learning and AI, but even with those, you know, how do we know that they're going to work? Where are, are there going to be mistakes in them? Is it really driven by the AI or is it driven by the people? who are building the AI. You know, lots of things to talk about there, which are beyond the scope of this talk, but I think interesting debates. So going to do this as academic research, it forced me to start asking some really fundamental questions. And one of those is, well, what is testing? Is it a repetitive mechanical activity or is it a highly cognitive or human activity? Is it defined by its activities or by its goals? And do you know what? All four of those things are true. It's really complicated. Just defining testing is not easy. So how can we talk about automating testing if we can't actually define easily what it is? So that was the first set of questions going through my mind. What, you know, what am I really talking about here? And if it's mechanical and, and repetitive, it could be automated. But if it's highly cognitive, does that mean it can't be automated? What happens if it uh, goes wrong? Um, why does it go wrong? Is that a problem with usability? So, so my, my super academic supervisors are saying to me, you're claiming it's a problem with usability. Do you know it's a problem with usability? I think, well, I think it is, but I haven't really got the evidence. Um, I do know that we want to improve it in some way, but how do we do that? How do we improve it? Can we pick off some activities to automate and then not automate others? Um, if it's highly cognitive human activity, is this one reason that we end up with shelfware? In other words, we buy tools, we find they don't quite do what we wanted. Um, what are actually the reasons for shelfware? So again, my supervisor's pushing me and saying, you're talking about that there's shelfware, is there? Is there really shelfware? Do you know what the reasons for it are? Do you know whether actually there is still so suddenly you realize that the questions you're trying to ask already contain their answers. So they're not good research questions. So they pushed me and pushed me and pushed me. And in the end, what it came back to was a simple open question that didn't contain its own answers. Actually, 
what are the experiences of testers with their tools and automation? Because they might not be the same as my experiences. Lots of people might be getting quite different experiences. So starting with that really open question, I then went and asked testers to tell me their stories. Just tell me a story about an experience you've had with test tools and automation. And uh, this was a piece of qualitative research. So you don't look for a very large number of participants, but you look for very in-depth answers that you spend a long time uh, analyzing. And I had people from across the globe, multiple countries, multiple business domains, um, over a hundred people took part. Um, it was getting on for 200 and for various reasons, not all of those came into the final final data. And I'll explain that, that as we go through. Uh, but there were a very wide range of backgrounds and experience. And they very often had complex roles with multiple responsibilities. So they weren't simply doing testing. They were doing a whole range of activities. So they might be a project manager who's also doing testing or a developer who's also doing testing or a tester who's also a product owner. There are all sorts of different um, uh, different roles that people had and complexity of roles and responsibilities. Um, and I just wanted to thank everybody who's taken part. And you can see the range of conferences in Europe, ANZTB is Australia and New Zealand, Star West, Star East and Canada are North America, Odin Days is Scandinavia. Um, so people from all over the world uh, took part in this and the contribution was really significant in shaping uh, the reports I came out with and was surprising. So that was the, that was the thing about it, it was surprising results. Um, and I, I interviewed a number of people, um, experts. Um, I ran a number of workshops and I also ran anonymous surveys. And then I had some testing experts review the findings and discuss them with me after I'd done the analysis. And I mentioned that not all of the participants data was used in all of the um, analysis. Um, I used the interviews and the workshop attendee information uh, with um, some of the quotes that I've used and some of the uh, backing up, if you like, um, some of the analysis. But I took my main results, um, the numbers, from the survey respondents that were anonymous. And the reason for that is that some of the people in the workshops privately said to me afterwards that they weren't comfortable about expressing what really they felt their experiences had been in an open forum. So I went to anonymous survey so that people could really say what what their experiences had been. And, and that's that's where the bulk of the report back and analysis uh, comes from. And my findings have come out in three academic papers, uh, stuck in limbo with magical solutions, scared, frustrated and quietly proud and an illusion of usability. Um, you can find these papers if you look on Google Scholar and search under those names. So what were the key findings coming out of this? The first one is the same old problems and challenges. So some of this, if you look, for example, at the test automation patterns wiki that uh, Doc Graham and Soretta Gamba put together, people have been talking about some of these problems for decades, like management support and maintenance of the tests and the tools. The, the shelfware problem is still there. People are still buying tools and acquiring tools and then in the end not using them. And these basic problems with management support, not being in, able to install the tools successfully, maintenance of the tests, security, usability, seamfulness, i.e. groups of tools not giving you a seamless experience, groups of tools being very clunky to work together. Those are still there decades after they were first being reported. That's worrying, I think. Um, so to give you examples of that, 
here are some quotes from people who filled in the surveys. So something looks cool, but took time to set up. It was, um, it was difficult to configure. Um, people getting stuck in limbo when they were asked to do automated testing. We'll come back to that one. Difficult part is maintaining the tests. So we can see those are the sorts of quotes that were coming up over and over again. Usability was a concern. So my initial hypothesis that usability was a problem, certainly it was. And the frequency of comments column, you can see there, the usability comments coming out about 511 of those across the surveys, uh, followed by technical problems. A lot of that was around portability, performance and maintainability. Those were the three most critical areas where people had had problems um, or had concerns. And then the management and organisational, interestingly, fewer comments, although sometimes it was bigger problems. And of the 111 people who filled in the survey, 82 had issues and challenges with their tools and automation, 82. So the first new finding is that people are stuck in limbo with magical solutions and that they're scared and frightened quite often. And this is about people's lived experiences. So how they feel about um, about the tools. What are the tools doing to them in their real lives? And the critical thing here is people's in, in level of emotion in their responses. Bearing in mind this is an anonymous online survey. 35% of people showed emotion and sometimes very high levels of emotion. And I wasn't asking them about their emotions in the questions. The questions were unemotional and I didn't ask about that. I didn't even ask them. I didn't even couch it as tell me about problems you've had. I, I, as you can see the questions there. The only question that didn't get an emotional response was SQ7, where most people were putting C question six answer, which actually helped me learn something about how you design a survey. Um, and I analysed this by the survey participants and by the questions to see, you know, is this just one or two people who are being very emotional? Is it a particular question? And no, it ranged across the people and it ranged across the questions. And some of those emotions were very pos positive, and, but a lot of them were quite negative. A lot of people were really quite distraught. It's not too strong a word. People were upset um, and here's some of the some of the just some of the quotes some of the many many quotes and you can see people are actually so angry so frustrated so upset upset people saying that oh, i'm just going to leave i'm just not going to do testing anymore it's too frustrating um, these tools are making my life difficult it's confusing it's a jungle out there so uh, if you get the papers, you'll see all these, these quotes are out there. But the point here is person after person expressing these high levels of emotion, which were actually having a knock on effect um, into how they were living their lives. People, people just um, say they wanted to give up completely. And this was backed up by some of the interviews that I did and some of the conversations that I had with people, not so much in the workshops, but um, around workshops and at conferences around this time, where people were in tears. People were in tears about what the effect that the tools were having on their, their working life. It was quite extraordinary. I simply wasn't expecting that. That was not what I set out to look for. Um, and then the stuck in limbo is a direct quote and the magical solutions is a direct quote. And that is in a way quite a calm set of quotes, but they're showing um, an underlying set of problems. And certainly the, the security problem, it came up several times and then it's come up several times since as I've been discussing these results with people. Uh, that people are mandated to use a particular tool 
and then the security set up in their organization doesn't allow it and the level of frustration you know that that's just i mean it's crazy stuff why are we doing this to ourselves or letting it happen to ourselves the second big finding is that usability is a problem but the way that we go around resolving those usability problems is actually illusory that what we're doing to try and solve usability problems doesn't work and then we think we've done usability and actually we kind of made the situation worse so three things about this and one of them is in some of these tools the people designing them had focused on the attractiveness of the interface over its usefulness. So the tool looked cool, but you couldn't actually do anything useful with it. It wasn't supporting people's workflow. It was simply looking good. And this is something which I think is really interesting that you can see demos of tools and they look really good. Are they actually going to support you to do the work you want to do? And who is being beguiled by that attractiveness? Is it a purse holder rather than the person who's actually going to do the work? The second thing was that it seemed that a lot of these tools simply focused on one user group. And so you've got a concept of learnability, which is part of usability, and you've got a concept of flexibility, which is part of usability. And they were sometimes in opposition. So you either had people with strong coding backgrounds that couldn't accomplish what they wanted to, because the attractive interface was holding them back. They weren't the options there. Or you had a situation where the tool had been built for people with very strong development backgrounds and the testers felt excluded and felt that it was too hard to learn. Now, if you're doing usability design or user experience design even more so one of the things you look at is the personas who are going to be using a particular tool so when you design a particular tool you also you as part of that you just you look at the personas and what their needs are and what the different personas are which ones you're serving but then when you buy a tool if you don't think about who is going to be using it and that there might be a range of people, you might try and get a tool which is one size fits all and it simply doesn't. And the third thing was with some of these tools that they didn't support change and growth for the personas and their requirements. So in other words, the people using the tools are going to change and their requirements are going to change. And if the tool has been built simply to meet them their needs at one particular stage of their career of this project it's not going to last over time so my analogy for this is about the difference between a pianola or player piano and a concert grand you see if you don't know how to play the piano and i put you in the carnegie hall with a concert grand you are not going to be able to play it and you're not it's going to take a long time to build up the skill to become that concert pianist. But once you've done that, once you've mastered it, you're working at the sort of Angie Jones level. You know, there's somebody who's a concert pianist of test automation. But if you're me, no, I can't play that, that piano. It's too complicated. I, I can't play the, the concertos and so on and so forth. But if you look at the pianola or player piano, You've got a role there that's going to play the music. You just slot in the role. It plays that music. And it, the keys are going up and down, but you don't have to be touching them. And the point here is it's only going to play that tune. You've got no flexibility and you're not going to learn how to play a piano. And somewhere between those two, there's a set of experiences and types of keyboard which would enable people to move from the pianola not all the way to being the concert pianist at the Carnegie Hall, but as far along that route as they need to go. And I think there would be a way that with the test tools and the test automation, that we could sit between those two extremes and have things which allow the people's knowledge to grow and their experiences to grow and the way they use the tool to change. 
and also to allow for growth in their requirements in terms of what the software is that they're testing and what the tests are that they need to use. So you're not being confined to something that's automated in a way that it can actually only do one thing. So usability is sometimes an illusory goal. It, so the other thing is, it's necessary. I'm, I, I think I have evidence from this research that it's necessary that people who are designing test tools think about usability, but it's not sufficient. You also need to think about maintainability, performance, security, portability, reliability, and so on and so forth. Key, it's not just attractive interfaces. So just because something looks nice doesn't mean it's the thing that you need to use. So don't, don't be beguiled. And key, it's not just about making it simple. Usability is not about ease of use. That's a tiny, tiny part of it. It's about making it appropriate. It's about making it meet people's workflows. So people reporting back about installation, um, you do an update which looked cool, but everything's hard to find. I love this one. I like how the feature works, but getting the information back out once it's been entered is not easy. Isn't this brilliant? I, a store only piece of information system. So you put your data in, you can't get the data back out again. Hmm, something wrong there, I think. So the key thing out of those findings so far that's really important is that test automation does have benefits. Test tools do have benefits, but it's affecting motivation and testers are becoming disassociated with their roles because their job task mix is changing and because the tools aren't supporting them properly. So one of the effects on motivation is around job task risks. And I've put some references at the bottom there, but the earliest one of those, Hackman and Oldman, talked about how you design people's jobs and people need a mix of tasks, some of which are challenging and some of which are more mundane because our brains need that mix. Different people, that mix is slightly different. But if you have a job that's just mundane, you're not being stimulated enough and it's demotivating. And if you have a job that has no mundane parts in it at all, it's overstimulating and overstressful. Uh, and Warden and Nicholson, when they did their motivational study of IT staff, which was back in the, the mid 90s, they commented that the testing role was simultaneously the most boring and the most stressful role because of what we're doing. So we're doing a lot of repetitive stuff and a lot of fine detail within that repetition, which you feel like is a candidate for automating or using tools with. And also we're dealing with things going wrong and people getting angry about stuff and deadlines and, and, and a lot of stress about having to give people bad news. So one of the things here is, if you automate all the mundane bits, you actually end up with somebody who's got a role that's just the stressful bits. And what's the effect of that going to be? That's, you know, so that sense of job task mix is really important. But simultaneously with that, you've got testers who are worried about being made redundant, who are feeling, feeling disassociated from their role because they're being told that the test testing is being done by the tools when they know that's not the case. And also, and here's a key thing, guess what? More things need testing than the software under test. Uh, so the picture on the left there is the worm Erebus that eats its own tail. So we have software that's under test and that requires testing. We have to design tests for it. And we design those tests, even if we're just thinking them up, even if we're just sketching things down, we might be doing a really formal process here or a really informal process, but our tests themselves are artifacts that we have built. And as human beings, we make mistakes. So our tests require reviewing and testing. Have we done those tests right? Have we fully understood what we're doing here? 
And if we build automation scripts or tools, that is software and software needs testing. So now the software test under test is the automation script that we're going to have to build tests for that will require testing. And maybe we should automate the testing of the automation scripts. Oh my goodness, we've got more software. We're going to have to test it. So we're sort of going around in circles. When do we stop? Because at every stage of everything we do, we will be making mistakes. There's no point where you can say, we can trust this absolutely, but we have to do that all the time. Where do we break this cycle? And that in itself is a frustration. One of the things that was, was frustrating for people was seeing test tools and automation being trusted when it was flawed and then having to pick up the mess when things go wrong. So I think that's, that, you know, this is very demotivating when people trust the tool more than the human. Which brings me back to artificial intelligence. You know, people are talking about the singularity, aren't they? And that the uh, artificial intelligence will start building more artificial intelligence and each time it's getting more and more intelligent. But, you know, at the bottom of that, at the bottom of that heap are human beings making their mistakes. Those mistakes are going to get built into the AI. And we know as human beings that the cleverer you are, the bigger the mistakes you make. Hmm. There's something going to go wrong here, I think. Anyway, that's speculation. Uh, one of the comments I had in an interview was somebody saying that the manager hadn't realized software is a bloody difficult thing to build. He was building, this guy was had built an automation tool and it took much longer to build this automation that had been planned. Um, it actually, it, it was planned for three months, I think, this project to build this automation. And it actually took three years to get it working because it was so complex. The automation was actually more complex than the software under test. And that's another interesting lesson. Testing is complex. Automating testing may be impossible because of the level of complexity. And again, you know, what does this do to people and their motivation and their ability to deliver? And one of the things there, this is uh, from a friend who's a historian, he's not in IT at all, and I was telling him about the research and he emailed me and said, you know, people change, people change to new products, um, but quite often they prefer not to change to new products, not to upgrade, because you know it's going to be bad. All the software out there is bad. The choice you've got is not between problematic and ideal, but between different sorts of problems. So why, why change your software? There's a certain despair in all of that. It's a lesson for all of us, isn't it? We're just struggling with messes and our customers are struggling with messes. So there's some pragmatically, what can you do now? Two things, better people management. Don't let, you know, watch out for people's, uh, the effect of, of tools and automation on people and better tool selection. Um, so I'm not going to read that slide out to you, but you know, think about the things I've talked about. It's not as simple as just buying a tool and, and telling people to use it. It's not as simple as just giving them a training course. You have to think about the effect of the tool on people's jobs and what it's going to do to them. And you also have to think about the attributes of that tool in terms of its usability, workflow support, but also things like portability, performance, maintainability. Think about taking a UX approach to actually tool selection. Think about the change and growth that's going to happen over time. Now, what am I going to do? I've got to finish my PhD. I'm about halfway through and so having done those three papers, it was time to take stock and say, what's the rest of my PhD going to be about? Uh, and I could have gone and looked more about testers' emotions and lived experience, which is incredibly interesting, but it's a huge area. It's multidisciplinary. So park that for the moment. It's too big for a PhD. However, 
some of the aspects of illusions of usability is possible to look at. And the first step of that is to actually think about who is doing testing. Because if we don't know who's doing the testing and how they're doing it, we don't know what tools they need and we don't know what the tools need to be like. So my next stage in my research that I'm, I'm in the middle of at the moment is to collect information about who is doing testing and how they are doing that. Um, and to do that, I've got a survey open um, and the link for that survey. Could you pop that into the chat for me, Atelier? Could you do that? That would be kind. Um, so I would urge you all to fill that in. And that survey is like an online interview. So it's not a short three or four question survey. It'll take you about 30 minutes, 45 minutes to fill in. I'm asking for a lot of detail. I need that detail in order to do the analysis that's next. I would urge you to take part. So my new hypothesis is that people aren't in the center of test tool design. And if we could put testers in the center of test tool design, we could support a wider range of people to do a better job in testing. So that's a hypothesis. OK, I haven't I haven't demonstrated that hypothesis yet. That's my current starting point. Is this the case? And it's based on looking at the previous participants. And I said to you before, wide range of background and experience and multiple responsibility. So I want to find out if that's true in a wider group of people than that initial 100 industry practitioners. I'm interested in hearing from you if you do testing as part any part of your role to find out your background, your qualifications, what you do in your work, how you go about testing, what sort of person you are, to help get an understanding of what the persona groups are within the testing industry and within IT. And once I've got that data, then I'm going to start mapping that and going through an iterative process that's a bit like a sort of um, uh, a bit like an infinity uh, diagram. I'm going to circle around. And as I get the data, I'm going to try and synthesize um, a tool design model and, 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 and then try and trial that and review the results and then come in and collect more data. So there's the link uh, here again for the, 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 the survey. Your experience and stories really matter for this to work. You're going to help academic researchers understand more about software testing. Um, there's sort of gaps there, I think. You're going to help me design a tool design model. Actually, you're going to help your future, future self. If this works, if I can make this work, we have a chance of actually better tools in the future. But it's going to take a while. So three key points. I've given you some insights from the research so far about people's experiences. I've given you an understanding that there's usability in human blockers to successful test tool implementation, and indeed that tools themselves block people. And I've asked you if you'll help me in the future research. Um, please complete the survey. So thank you for listening. I'm going to sh stop sharing my screen now and we'll go to a Q&A. There we go. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you very much for sharing the insights of this case study. Thanks for having me.